happy to introduce Kate Clements, who is a teaching specialist in uh, MELP, and she also teaches um, computer assisted language learning at Hamlin University. She has a BA in Spanish and Journalism and an MA at ESL. She's a world traveler. I'm just really excited to read about your travels on uh, your little description on, on the MELP page. And she's really interested in the role of technology in foreign language and second language learning. So today she's going to talk about tech tools for language learning, what really works. So please welcome Kate. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Thanks for coming. And so, as Kate said, today's presentation is about the effectiveness of computer-assisted language learning tools. And I'll be presenting the results of a lit review that I did last year about the different tools, if they work, if they not, if they don't, as supported by research. And I'm also going to provide an overview on the tools that exist for U of M faculty and students. And I'm going to be looking at the centrally supported tools, so things that work with Moodle and with Google. I have not used Canvas personally, which is the competitor to Moodle, and so I'm not going to be talking about Canvas at all, and I'm also not going to be talking about third-party or textbook or publisher-specific tools. So I know that my Spanish lab exists and um, Quizlet exists and all sorts of things exist, but we won't be looking at those today. So the lit review. I did this last summer as part of an online and distance learning certificate program here at the University of Minnesota. And the class was Foundations of Distance Learning. It's supposed to be the first class you take in the sequence, but it was the last class I took. <laughs> so I got the foundations at the very end, which is good. It was a three-week intensive course um, taught by Jolie Kennedy. It's a great class. And our final project was a lit review about something related to online or um, distance learning. I was the only humanities person in the class. I was the only language enthusiast. But I had a lot of latitude to do whatever I wanted for the final project. So I decided to take a look at the different tools, if they work, how they work. Because as an instructor here and as a tech enthusiast, I wonder what works. When I go to Moodle, you see that there's all these different things that you can plug in, but I never know if they actually help my ESL students improve their language acquisition. So I really did want to dig deeper and see, you know, see what works, what do the experts say about this. And the lit review that we had to do was supposed to be between 2,500 and 3,500 words. They didn't give us a limit of how many articles we needed to look at. So I'll back up a little bit and talk about the background of computer-assisted language learning, or CALL. And I, as you all know, as language instructors, um, foreign language learning has always used technology to enhance acquisition. This is my this is my timeline that I made up, a little bit tongue-in-cheek, where before the advent of the printing press, there was handmade media. I'm sure that there were books and you know the Vulgate gospel and everything else being handed around for people to learn their second language. After the printing press, books in your second language were widely available to help your acquisition. 20th century, Way back when I started learning language, it was, we had our pre-recorded songs and movies that were played in Spanish and French and German class. And then later in the 20th century, audio recordings to evaluate your production of language became more available. And as technology improved, or as it um, developed, these tools moved online. And so what I'm looking at today or what I looked at in the lit review was um, the tools that are available with computers. So either online tools or onboard tools like software. 
I know we can say that everything is technology, chalk is technology, whiteboards are technology, they are, but that was not part of my lit review. And call, call is a large and growing field. There's, you know, all of these tools are online. There's a lot of interest in them. There's huge interest sections in call. And like I said, there's a lot of tools available, but we don't have a lot of data about how well they work. In fact, um, Catherine Murphy Judy talked about the serious lack of comprehensive data uh, about online language education. You know, we know people do it, but does it work? We need more data. And we don't have a lot of data about best practices with language learning. So for, so for myself, for this lit review, I looked at six journal articles devoted to best practices and effectiveness in call tools. All of the articles were from peer-reviewed journals, and they were all from within the last 10 years. That was the deadline I set for myself of knowing you know, what would be most recent. I found some interesting articles about using Palm Pilots in class, decided not to, not to include those. I, I looked on a variety of um, databases that I found through the University of Minnesota libraries, and I searched for com computer-assisted language learning and effectiveness computer-assisted language learning and best practices in order to find my articles. In the end, I found nine articles that looked useful and, in the end, I scanned them. I discarded three because they didn't have the data I was looking for. And so, in the end, six articles. If you can't read this, uh, let me know. I can, I'm happy to share my PowerPoint with you. So our six articles were from 2015 to 2007. From the Modern Language Journal, from the um, Journal of Computer Assisted Language Learning, Linguistics and Language Compass, Journal of Computer Assisted Learning, We have online foreign language education. What are the proficiency outcomes from 2015? Jillian um, Lord, I don't know how to use words in Spanish. Rosetta Stone, and learner proficiency outcomes. Nelika van Duysenschol, assessing outcomes in foreign, online foreign language education. What are the key measures for success? Um, technologies for foreign language learning, a review of technology types and their effectiveness. Uh, best practices in technology and language teaching. And technology-assisted learning, a longitudinal field study of knowledge category, learning effectiveness, and satisfaction in language learning. These were all articles that had some sort of data about what worked and what didn't. That was what I was looking for in these articles. So I evaluated the articles based on how their results were analyzed, what, we, what they were looking at, what they were measuring. So the first article we have by Mark Hoopengarner, he looked at the four different mod modalities, listening and speaking, reading and writing, separately. And he provided a list of many tools available, and so it was a, it was a comprehensive list from 2009, but he provided evidence of uh, only for pronunciation improving tools. These were the ones where he had research that said, yes, this works, yes, this helps students improve their foreign language acquisition. And, so, and he um, singled out speech recognition software, signal analysis software, and internet-based voice chat as being useful for second language acquisition. And we will look at some of those tools later. The next article was from several authors. Lead author was Golanka. This is a great article. I strongly recommend it. 
their team looked at more than 350 different tools, and they divided those into four different categories, not by modality, but by whether they were school, house, or classroom-based tech. So was it a management learning system like Moodle or Blackboard or Canvas? Um, was it an individual tool that a student would use on his or her own, like a dictionary? Um, was it social media, network-based? Or was it a, po a portable device, like an iPod? So they had these 350 different tools, and then they looked at the research to see if the claims for the effectiveness had any support, had any backing um, in the research. So if a publisher makes a claim that says, well, with this, with this tablet, this amazing tablet, learners would attend more to reading tasks, is there any evidence that backs that up? And then they divided their evidence into strong, moderate, or weak support. So strong support would be three different studies saying, yes, this tablet helps. Moderate support would be yeah, one well-designed study, two or more well-designed studies with partially contradictory evidence, two or more studies with design limitations. So that would be moderate, OK support. And then weak support is expert opinions. You know, they're based on theory or your own practice, but not empirical data, which is what I tend to use. Uh, <laughs> it worked for me. Uh, one well-designed study with contradictory evidence or design limitations, or a study with a flaw in the methodology, or if the methodology was not explained in detail. Their results. Not surprisingly, weak support for many claims, moderate support for some claims, strong support for a few claims about technology's effectiveness. So they found strong support showing that um, computer-assisted pronunciation training, especially automatic speech recognition, works. They also found strong support for writing aids like chat. And they found moderate support for claims that certain technology enhanced the learner's output, it enhanced their motivation, it enhanced feedback, or that it enhanced their metalinguistic knowledge. And then weak support for everything else. So comparing this with the previous study that we saw, the Hoop and Garner, they agree on the effectiveness of pronunciation training. Any questions so far? Can you go into more detail about how they constructed scales and how the people who provided evidence um, discussed, for example, output mm -hmm. and, and all that, or should we just get to work and look at Golonka? So Golonka is actually, I mean, so it is a lit review. So I'm, I did a lit review of a lit review. And so their team looked at all the research about, you know, into effectiveness. And, you know, and so they looked to see if there were different studies that showed that each of these different tools actually worked. I have the article. I'm happy to share it with you. Thanks. It's excellent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So just to, just to tie it all up mm -hmm. so far, support for effectiveness is so more or less limited to pronunciation. So far, yeah. Two articles in. Mm -hmm. Yes. And this, on um, the next article by Hui Hu et al., they had two different groups. Um, they had a face to face control group and then a face to face technology enhanced experimental group of ESL students. Um, so they, their, their control group is traditional. They're in class however many hours a week. And then the control group is also in class the same number of hours, but they have access to this course management system that the um, researchers developed themselves. And this course management system included a lot of um, vocabulary tools, mainly. 
um, dictionaries, I think there were um, word neighbors, things like that. Um, their results were that the tech-assisted group experienced gains in vocabulary acquisition, which would be expected because their CMS has a lot of vocabulary tools with it. But they found that the control group did better with listening acquisition. Maybe they were paying attention in class more. We don't know. But their conclusion is that tech-assisted learning is useful for some language acquisition, for vocabulary acquisition. So here you're comparing different things. They're comparing, you know, they're comparing two groups in their own study. <laughs> um, the, okay, the, ne the next article by Lynn and Warshower, 2015. They are now looking at Duolingo and Rosetta Stone. Part of the article was devoted to Duolingo and Rosetta Stone. Most of the article was about fully online language acquisition, but they did devote part of the article to talking about the effectiveness of Duolingo and Rosetta Stone. Has anyone in here used either of these? Okay, so there's some familiarity with these. And they referenced a previous study by Veselinov and Grego, which showed that 34 hours using Duolingo is equal to the first semester of college Spanish, which would be 75 hours, is that right, Pablo, in class for the first semester Spanish? But then you, you need 55 to 60 hours of Rosetta Stone to get the same results as the first semester of college Spanish. But they stress that this is only talking about vocabulary, grammar, and reading comprehension. And they also cautioned that this is about achievement. It's not about proficiency. There was no oral interview. And it might not be applicable to other languages or other levels. <clears throat> but perhaps based on this, we can surmise that Duolingo is more effective than Rosetta Stone, at least for introductory Spanish. Our next article by um, Melika van Doysenschol was looking at proficiency outcomes, again for Rosetta Stone, and also Tell Me More. Has anyone used Tell Me More here? I've not used it. Apparently, it's, it's a virtual language you know, teacher software. And it's for, for self-study, much like Rosetta Stone is. And she points out that it's really hard to get information about Rosetta Stone and Tell Me More because of the attrition rate. A lot of people start these programs, they mean to follow through, and they don't. So of the 150 people who were supposed to use Rosetta Stone, only one went through the whole program. Out of the 176 who wanted to use, who said they would use Tell Me More, only four completed the whole course of study. And her, her findings were that um, the Rosetta Stone and Tell Me More users, they had some proficiency gains, limited proficiency gains. Their lack of social interaction with actual speakers of the language is a drawback. And interestingly, she also notes briefly that high definition teleconferencing for language teaching, particularly less commonly taught languages, has benefits for learner motivation, <laughs> which is good news for Pablo. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. I have a question about the, this mm -hmm. study compared to the last one. Mm -hmm. Did the, can you back up? The sure. Mm -hmm. Did Lynn and Warshower mm -hmm. address at all this issue of motivation? How did they get, how did they get so many students to mm -hmm. teach the, mm -hmm. It looks mm -hmm. like they completed mm -hmm. the equivalent of a first semester. Did they talk at all about how they got, mm -hmm. what were their mm -hmm. numbers, and how did they get that many students? So I, I don't remember that off the top of my head. Mm -hmm. I can look it up. Mm -hmm. And so their, their article was devoted to online language learning overall, and then they just they had a section where they're talking about 
using Rosetta Stone or Duolingo. Mm -hmm. And I don't remember how many people they talked to okay. or how many, you know, how many participants they had. But certainly in this study, which, you know, which was not done by her, it was done by Nielsen in 2011, there were very few participants who followed through. Mm -hmm. I, I believe they did. So to mm -hmm. show a limited proficiency gains makes absolute sense. No mm -hmm. matter. So. Mm -hmm. yeah, good point. Is, mm -hmm. is this a study they did with government employees? I don't know. I don't think so. I think it was college students. Do you mean the state department? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think the numbers were even higher there. I mean, the, rate the, the attrition was? was? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think they had hundreds. They were mm -hmm. employed as part of their job. And they, and they stopped. <laughs> they just, they, yeah. Motivation's hard to keep up in any language class, and if it's just you, it is hard. Mm -hmm. I was going to say, it makes a big difference, too, if it is part of a class, mm -hmm. whether they are actually doing it as self-study. Mm -hmm. This is a part of a class that's moving through different times at the same time. There's opportunity for online discussion, live discussion. So the, the context that they're doing this in is a huge difference. And we're, and we're going to look at um, another study that has more information about Rosetta Stone as it is used you know, in a college course throughout a semester. And so here, this study is, is looking at proficiency gains. So that's what is being measured here, the proficiency gains with this particular software or softwares. So the, the Gillian Lord article from 2015 is analyzing proficiency gains again with students using Rosetta Stone in hybrid or fully online contexts. And so these are college students who are doing this throughout the course of the semester. And she had three different groups of beginning Spanish learners. So there's the traditional class, no Rosetta Stone at all. Um, a hybrid class that's following the, um, that, that's using Rosetta Stone and also meeting three times a week in the classroom. And then there's a fully online Rosetta Stone group. So three different groups of college students. And she analyzed their progress throughout the semester using um, standardized grammar and vocab tests, but also proficiency tests, you know, OPI type tests. Her results, not very kind for Rosetta Stone. On one hand, she found that the test scores for the groups were roughly equivalent. But as we know, it's not just about test scores. She found that there were real differences in terms of their use of Spanish in the oral interviews. And the students who had learned in the classroom were able to handle communication breakdowns. They were able to negotiate in Spanish they um, could use the language in real ways, whereas the Rosetta Stone only students, they could not use it meaningfully. And I believe that the title of her, uh, of her article was, you know, I don't know how to say it in Spanish. <laughs> and so her conclusion, which we can all get behind, is that Rosetta Stone is useful for learning some forms, but you need the classroom for communicative um, competence. Question? Do you know if, if she used the online part of the live interactive part of Rosetta Stone? Or was they just using the software? I don't know. Because there is a part to it now. Mm -hmm. the actual online mm -hmm. data students mm -hmm. do live practice. So I'm just curious. I should use that. Yeah. Do you know how recent that is? So it's, po it's possible. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure she did. She did, okay. Right, because she would have done the study in probably 2014, so, but I don't think she did. So if this is all not clear in everyone's heads right now, for your ease of use, we have a handy chart that is comparing the different articles and the findings so the Hoop and Garner study from 2009, he's looking at all the modalities. 
but he did find empirical evidence only supporting pronunciation software. Um, the Golonka study was classifying things into, you know, is it school, is it classroom, are they individual tools, is it social media, or is it a portable device? And she analyzed, or their, their team analyzed them different ways. The Hui article was looking at this proprietary CMS comparing face-to-face -face and hybrid classes. Lynn and Warshower, they were looking at the hours of each tool needed to equal um, one semester of college Spanish. And Dyson Schall, looking at Rosetta Stone and Tell Me More, she analyzed or she compared proficiency gains. And Lord, again looking at Rosetta Stone, looking at grammar and vocab scores and um, oral proficiency interviews. Their conclusions, or my conclusions, the tools available to us are vast. The number of tools is vast. A standardized measure of, of effectiveness, or an absolute measure, does not yet exist. All of the articles had these different bases of comparison. And as we know, fluency is hard to gauge. And these articles were comparing apples and oranges. And in terms of fluency being hard to gain, there's a nice quote from Blake saying, you know, seeking out comparative student outcomes might constitute a reasonable exercise if the profession actually knew how to measure rigorously or even define language proficiency in a scientific manner. So we're looking at many different things. However, that said, there are still some things that all of the different um, researchers agreed upon as being effective. What works? According to Hoopengarner, speech recognition software works. Signal analysis software, internet-based voice chat. That works. Galanka and her crew agree. Pronunciation training, especially automatic speech recognition and chat. Wu found that, um, that vocab tools help. Wordless tools, dictionaries, the thesauruses, word neighbors. Lynn and Morshauer, Duolingo works for introductory Spanish. And one takeaway from the Van Doysen Scholl article is that high def video conferencing works. Any questions so far? Okay. And some additional findings. Everyone agreed, and then the research supported, that online language learning was as effective as traditional or face to face learning. And some of them suggested that um, courses that supplement face-to-face -face instruction with tools are, in fact, the most effective way to learn. So that is our literature review. Now I would like to look at the tools that are available to us. Can you, sorry, can you back yeah. that up? Uh -huh. um, Kate? Yeah. And um, the conclusion that you reached there it surprises me because mm -hmm. I was, as we were going through this, the idea of the mm -hmm. sense that I was getting was that online tools were useful in some very specific, mm -hmm. for some very specific functions like mm -hmm. learning vocabulary or mm -hmm. uh, pronunciation. I didn't get the sense from what you were saying that even research supported that online language learning was as effective as traditional face to face learning. Mm -hmm. But I was getting a different So I, I'm talking about an online class that's taught by an instructor and that meets regularly, um, you know, that is 
might or might not be from a university or a school, but not, not Rosetta Stone or Duolingo that you're doing on your own, but simply that a class that takes place online. in the online environment. If you take Spanish 1004 online from the U of M, you'll have the same gains as a student who's taking the traditional class you know, in the classroom. So online language learning there doesn't include mm -hmm. discrete tools mm -hmm. to help students, right? Rosetta Stone, or mm -hmm. Duolingo, or maybe some games that mm -hmm. the online language learning refers to classes. Right, yeah, yeah, a, a, a class with a supportive environment with an instructor where you are interacting with others in class. Okay. You're interacting online, you're not interacting in the classroom, but that's the kind of online class or online environment they're referring to. So they're not comparing self-study with Rosetta Stone as being as effective as one semester of Spanish. Make sense? Yep. Okay. So I wanted to look now uh, at the tools that we have at our disposal. Um, and these are, again, the centrally supported tools. Your departments might have different tools. Your students might have different tools at home with their phones because students have all sorts of things in their phones. So this will be just a look at those. Okay, pronunciation. Automatic speech recognition. I should have saved this for last because this is my, um, my experiment. It's what Hoop and Garner, or it's what Golanko would call weakly supported by evidence because it's something that I use. But it's something that I think would be interesting for us to all look at and use with our students. Because now, thanks to the wonders of Google, you can do something like this where you could have the students repeat phrases that you have written and compare what they have done using voice typing. Click on this. Now this amazing tool comes in different languages. So let me see how my Arabic is. I know we have an Arabic instructor. Be nice. <laughs> let me think. Salam alaikum. How did I do? <laughs> All right. But if I sal ali mukum, <laughs> not the same. Right. So. This is something that we could work with and possibly, you know, research and someone can do a dissertation here and see how it works. And I did check it with other languages um, to see how it works. I did a very unscientific study with my ESL students. Are there any Chinese speakers here? Xiu how? Ah, not so good. Xiu mm how? -hmm. Not so good. <laughs> sure. So, tools. Um, let me see if I can. Tools, voice typing, this shows up, you can choose your language. Mm -hmm. Yes, so um, let me think, English United States. This is the kind of thing that my students have a hard time saying, my intermediate level ESL students. So 
This raised many questions about disease for expert. So it was pretty accurate. Yes, it was. That's a pretty good, that's a pretty good microphone. Yeah. And so our students can see, my, my students a lot of time they think I said raises. I said that. No, you didn't. You said raise. I said that. And so if they use this, they might be able to see that they are not saying raises, that they are in fact saying raise or raised. There seems to be, mm -hmm. I think you did the singular question, mm -hmm. and it corrected you. Well, you're right. This is extraordinarily forgiving. It, um, it can sometimes guess what you're saying. Yeah. And so I would recommend this for beginning level students, upper level students. If they make a mistake, it might guess what they were trying to say. No. <laughs> um, I, I don't think you can, like in this program, yeah. it, that, that would be useful. Well. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. I'm seeing, mm -hmm. I'm not seeing that, but there is, I mean, th there are a lot of languages on here. Is it only accessible using I don't know. So again. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is you know, a suggestion that we could use. Pronunciation, other pronunciation tools that are widely available to us. Um, signal analysis software. Audac there, we have Audacity, we have Pratt, and would these be considered centrally supported? Not so much, okay. So we have them at the Language Center, but they are not centrally supported. I am one of the few, I think, strong devotees to Pratt. We're a, we're a small but um, loyal group. I very much like Pratt because it will analyze intonation, word stress, and also tones. If your students are having a hard time learning the intonation in their second language, um, word stress, and then in tonal languages, you could use Pratt as well. So this is a lesson in intonation. Who does she work for? Who does she work for? And this is measuring the intonation curve for visual learners. It can be very useful. It's freeware. It's readily accessible. Uh, vocabulary building, I think a lot of instructors do this right now um, with, of course there's um, note cards, I really like my students to use index cards, do it the old school way, but you can of course incorporate a glossary into Moodle. You could have group glossaries, the whole group continu uh, contributes to a glossary list about a certain article, or individual glossary, um, glossaries on Moodle. You can have Ahmed's um, list or Mohammed's list of vocabulary. Ann? I realized, uh, Kate, that you emailed me separately about this, and I could have raised this at that time, so sorry about that. Mm -hmm. But um, I just wanted to uh, make sure that the Moodle Technology Enhanced Learning Team also has a, uh, a uh, module that works with the database tool in the uh, Moodle that uh, you could copy in your course site that Oh, neat. Okay. So, so um, flashcards built in. Is it, um, and it's only with Moodle? Is it with, is it with anything else? No, it was hand coded for Canvas. Oh. I'm sorry, Moodle. For Moodle. Okay. Okay. 
And Moodle has chat. Moodle has a very nice chat feature. If you want to have class offline, if you want the students to practice you know, um, chatting with you, chatting with each other, it's not voice to chat. It's um, actual you know, um, typed chat. But it's very robust, and I have used that successfully. Google, you could use a vocab list um, with um, a Google Doc, a Google spreadsheet. And then, of course, Google has chat. Um, they have video chat. They have text chat, which is built right into our um, mail. Video conferencing. There are so many options here that you know of that your students probably use. Um, you know, FaceTime, Skype, WhatsApp, Facebook. Um, those all exist, but they're not centrally supported. We have Google Hangout, um, WebEx, and also, I called this Cisco, but this is um, what we use at the Language Center for the, um, for the classes, the course year classes, thank you. These are listed in terms of ease of use. This is the easiest to use, this is the hardest to use, but it also, in terms of resolution, the WebEx and Cisco video conferencing looks just amazing. It's, it's crystal clear. It's a little bit more intensive to set up. So my final thoughts are, this is a list of tools. They're just tools. Good learning requires a teacher, requires a curriculum, it requires a community. It requires you know, an appropriate and judicious choice of technology. So <laughs> I hope this was useful for, to, for you, and thank you for coming. <laughs> if you have any questions, you can. <laughs> I've used it for specific reasons, um, for specific pronunciation features. If I'm teaching, say, the S or the ED ending, and I will have these sentences that have a lot of those features, and then students um, in, in the computer lab with headsets on, they, you know, it's, um, they are supposed to repeat the sentence that I have written, like I had up there, and then they compare and see if what they said is exactly what was written. So, to increase their awareness of what they say. Yes, it, yes, it is absolutely awareness raising for them. And did you see that awareness increase? I saw a light go off. I saw the students say, oh, oh, I guess I really am saying it wrong. It wasn't enough for their instructor to say that. They had to see it in front of them. <laughs> so that, that's how I have used it. They were advanced, and so these are fossilized errors. Mm -hmm. And it, it, again, it was in the pronunciation class only for a few discrete points. Mm -hmm. But yeah, a lot of times it is. You know, it is this awareness raising on a, on a fossilized error. I'm just wondering if you could mm -hmm. do something like that with audacity. Mm -hmm. um, well, and I, I yeah. I, I've, well, I'm just, I'm mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm mm -hmm. just wondering if also them being able to see it visually, mm -hmm. uh, see the sound mm -hmm. is useful. But I don't mm -hmm. know enough about Audacity to know if you could. Is that even an option in Audacity? It is in Audacity, but it's better in Pratt. Mm -hmm. And so I've and I've used Pratt a lot for intonation, so that the students get enough intonation. If students have very flat intonation, it's useful for me to take a long clip mm -hmm. and say, look at. You know, the intonation curves here. I want you to record it, look at your intonation patterns, and then they say, oh, yeah, it's, it's not quite as expressive as hers. I guess I do need to, you know, to work on that more. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Um, can we see an example of how you use Audacity or Pratt? Um, do you assign it as one more, like, just an example of how I'm happy you asked that. Mm -hmm. 
So this, this is an activity that we have used with Pratt. Um, there, actually, there's one, but then there's a different one. Uh, that's not it. This might be it. That's the same thing. I was very surprised when I asked another instructor for some information about Pratt, and she said, I have this wonderful worksheet, and she mailed, emailed it to me, and it was actually my worksheet. So <laughs> it was it's like, <laughs> but um, I, I have used it, I've used Pratt with word stress like this, you know, where the students will, you know, they get a conflict, they need to see that the stress goes right there, conflict. Um, versus, you know, versus a conflict versus conflict. So that would be a word level exercise. I have a different exercise that is for intonation over longer, um, over longer stretches. I'm happy to share that with you if you'd like. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Did you ever use the automatic speech recognition and um, choose a language Press the mic and then simply and enter an audio stem from mm -hmm. a passage. Yeah. How does that work? It works. For example, if you have Spanish and mm -hmm. you have it um, for people from different areas, different pronunciations, mm -hmm. um, have you tried that? I've used Google Voice typing to transcribe an interview, and it worked pretty well. It wasn't. It wasn't 100% accurate, but it was okay. It saved a lot of time. But um, in terms of the different accents, you know, what, what sort of accents do we have here? Spanish from Argentina, Bolivia, Chile, Colombia, Costa Rica, Ecuador, El Salvador, oh gosh. Um, but if, you're, if, some, if, if you have Spanish from Nicaragua selected and Pablo says something, will it understand him in his Castilian Spanish? I, I would assume so. Well, I'm not it, it's probably also a, a measure of um, socioeconomic class. Really Ooh. <laughs> That's mm. Yeah, so I, I, have not, I, I have not done much with the different accents here. Like I said, this is very much in beta. Yeah. I think they just came out with the different um, languages in the, last, in the last year. They had it only in English for a long time. I don't work for Google. <laughs> just, you know, <laughs> let's have that out there. <laughs> yeah? Did anyone in your literature mention Yabla? I, yes, someone did, but, I, but there was no data on it. There, were, there were no metrics, so I didn't include it. I, I, th I think it was in the same, the Lynn and Warshower um, article that also was talking about Rosetta Stone and um, Duolingo, I believe. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Okay, thank you again. Thank you. Mm -hmm.